next we have Larry Spotted Crow Man. I had introduced him earlier as he had done our opening words and and song to 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 start this this event off proper. Larry will be discussing the importance of cultural preservation through the work he does as co-director of Okateo Cultural Center, a storyteller and an author. Thank you, Larry. Uh, thank you all for listening out there once again. It's a real honor to be a part of this. And um, just to keep the music going a little bit, uh, I wanted to uh, open up again with another song and this time with our traditional rattle song, which we call um, sometimes referred to as longhouse songs. Um, so I'm going to share this uh, song here. <clears throat> Rattle songs in the Nipmuc language. Yahweh, 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 na. We ya na, we ya na, we ya. Ha ya na, we ya na, we na. We ya na, we ya ne ya. Ha ya na, we ya na, we ya. Ha ya, we ya na, we na. It's the young new witch in the pea we ya. It's the young new witch in the one. Chemoche monache, chemoche monache, chemoche monache, ya, 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 Hey, <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I wanted to start off with that song. Let me get a drink here. This is a song that we would share. Uh, as I said um, earlier, I'm in part of my traditional homeland here in the, the Quinnebog watershed. And, um, and so the rivers and the ocean where our, our highways, our places of trade, our, our familiar passageways to, to really share, connect, nourish, uh, uh, and really uh, live our, 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 fullest, uh, our fullest experiences of, of, of who we are as a people. Um, however, unfortunately, through the dams and industrial revolution, a lot of that was lost, but I don't have time to get into all that uh, uh, conversation today, but um. It's important to share this song uh, because uh, it is about the story uh, that we share when we sing these songs. Um, and uh, by the way, the words are in Nipmunk and uh, the translations are, we live for the water, the water lived for us. Paddle strong, uh, human beings, paddle strong. Uh, and the translation in English would sometimes be uh, water is life. And so water was acknowledged as a, as a living being and as a, as a relative that we would share because we are living for the water and the water is living for us. And we're taught that, um, if you take care of these things, the trees here, the birds and the, all the different uh, living things around us, and they'll take care of you. They want to help us. Um, and uh, that's an important thing. So I'm really honored by what I heard here today and uh, some very powerful words. And uh, a lot of it, uh, some of you out there may be hearing it for the first time. And um, we have a very difficult conversation to get to. Um, and our, our stories, our music, our language, our drum, our dances, our healing medicine that keep us going, that keep us alive, that keep our communities vibrant. But we have this hard conversation that needs to be had in this wider, larger dialogue that's happening here today. And it's very important. Uh, again, as uh, Rhonda, my sister Rhonda shared, uh, my name is Larry Spotted Crow Man. I'm from the Nipmog Nation. I'm a writer, a uh, culture educator, uh, traditional storyteller. Uh, I've been sharing my work now for about three decades. Uh, I've been traveled, I've traveled to different parts of the world with my books. Um, very humbled and honored to be able to share uh, Nipmunk voice in spaces where uh, I thought it would never be. Um, 
a little background on my tribe of, again, the Nipmunk people. Nipmunk means people of the fresh water. Our homeland uh, once stretched four states, uh, which was about 2,000 square miles from the Connecticut River, just on the other side of Natick, northern Connecticut, northern Rhode Island, and the southern tip of New Hampshire. And a lot of that loss uh, was explained uh, very el uh, eloquently and succinctly by uh, uh, Jim Peters earlier in this conversation, where we, uh, my people were essentially pushed down to four and a half acres in, uh, in Grafton. Uh, and also uh, prior to that, uh, I'm a descendant of the survivors of Deer Island after the 1675, 1678 um, King Philip's War, where um, much of that decimation took place on Nipmunk homeland. Uh, we've lost thousands of people. Uh, our people were sold into slavery. Um, the ones who uh, chose to try to follow the English way and go into these praying towns such as Natick and, and Grafton and, and uh, Wamasset and, and several others, they were uh, rounded up because of uh, the English said, well, they're all Indians. We can't really trust any of them. So they were rounded up and taken to Deer Island in uh, October, right around this time, uh, actually, uh, of the year. And um, with no provisions, no food, no shelter, and hundreds starved to death. And those who didn't starve to death and die were captured by uh, pirate slave merchants who were just snatching them off the island. And uh, I'm here today because some of those people didn't die. I'm here today because... Um, the willingness of my ancestors to, per, to, to pursue and, and, and be who they are and still try to believe in what this country stood for. Because not only that, my story continues on where um, I'm the son of the Revolutionary War two times, two grandfathers, and then following that by great, great, great grandfathers and all their siblings uh, fought in the Union Army for the Civil War. Uh, and there's a book about them in the Mashantucket Pequot Museum from uh, entitled from uh, from Appomattox to Mashantucket, and it highlights a lot of my relatives, the Vickers, Pegan family, and Hazards, and, and those are all my relatives there. And um, and it, it talks about the sacrifice that these indigenous people were doing while their kids were being put in boarding schools, their land was usurped. Um, and so these are the experiences that we are evolved from and that we have to, to endure and survive from and to continue on with, with their culture. Um, Myself, I'm now in my early 50s. I grew up in the 70s and 80s in Western Mass. And it was probably one of the most horrible experiences in my life, going to school, uh, being pushed to the outside uh, from a world that was essentially going through its crisis of um, the busing and all the different things that were going on. And Native people were just kind of uh, an enigma uh, uh, to everybody. And so we were the least likely to get support from whether it was our teachers, our, our community, and so on, unless we were within our own uh, uh, enclaves. Um, and so it was probably one of the worst times of my life being a native person and the teachers telling me I don't exist or cut your hair or you people are savages and stop being wild and all these different pejorative things that I had to kind of deal with. And um, that led to a very difficult time in my life. It led to drugs, alcohol, and I nearly died by the time I was 21. Um, Remarkably, I've always been a, a person who wanted to learn. I loved science, I loved knowledge. And of course, alcohol was impeding that, that, that journey for me. And I was near death at 21. And um, ironically, you know, in the hospital, uh, PBS was on a documentary about Christopher Columbus, of all people. And they're going into this, the, the narrative is talking about how alcohol was introduced to, the, to uh, the native people from Europe and summarily destroyed every fabric of their life through this weaponized alcohol. And um, after I watched that, uh, I can't really explain in words what came over me, but it was a, an awakening that is still alive in me today after 30 years, because I left that hospital and never drank again after that day. And I began on this journey, this looking around in this post-apocalyptic fog of what we call America and trying to figure out what has happened to my ancestors, the boarding schools, the, the usurping of land, um, the generational trauma and all the different things that we've experienced. Uh, basically, uh, essentially telling native people that we're, we're here to benefit. We're just hapless, uh, hapless bystanders uh, benefiting from white proximity, that we have no contributions to the world. They didn't teach us about the, the, the wonderful polyculture of the three sisters, how this technique of growing is far outweighs the monoculture of the English. They didn't teach us that, uh, because of the discovery of rubber and, 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 uh, and um, uh, petroleum by the indigenous people here, there would not be an industrial revolution. They didn't tell us that the women's suffrage movement was actually started by Iroquois people, our neighbors over here. We didn't get to learn these things. We just got to see ourselves on a football helmet. 
the proud savage, the, the warrior in this perpetual state of violence, always ready to fight and, and, and do these kind of things. No, no intellectual curiosity. The incredible amount of science, uh, intellectual pursuits, philosophy, diplomacy, uh, romance, all the different things, music, philosophy, were not, were not attributed to the indigenous people where it was essentially stolen from. Um, and today science is still trying to catch up and they call it something called um, quantum physics, I believe, when they're trying to understand the, the uh, singularity that indigenous people talk about when we say all my relations. Well, we were already talking about that. When you, if you look behind me, I see my relatives here, the trees and the birds that are going by. And um, it's not just this abstract notion, it's real because we're all just vibrating. We're all just vibrations of this universe, right? We're all just broken down. When we look at in the molecular level, we're just vibrations where these tiny little things of light coming together to make what we are us, right? And so the trees are doing it, the birds are doing it, the water's doing it, everything. And so we're not separated from anything. But what happened to indigenous people, right? In this country, we did get separated from all this knowledge. We were told we don't fit in. We were told we don't belong. Um, and that has devastating effects on the psyche, on the, on the emotional out, outcome of, of, a, of a human being when they're taught to feel that they're nothing. Um, and I've experienced that. We're seeing this today because this goes right into our contemporary issues of uh, across reservations, the United States and Canada, where indigenous people are disproportionately uh, uh, likely to, to commit suicide, uh, drugs, alcohol, or the big three that we call depression, alcoholism, and, and, uh, uh, and diabetes, that we suffer from these disproportionately, needlessly. Um, these all are tribute to about the story. Um, and so what are we telling the story to ourselves as native people? What is this country telling the story to, to themselves? And we talked a little bit about that earlier when we looked at the um, doctrine of discovery. When we think about in terms of the doctrine of discovery, we're thinking about America, promised lands, uh, God's chosen people, endless resources, opportunity, freedom. Well, there's people like myself who come from none of that. We come from a shared and lived experience of genocide, enslavement, removal, boarding schools, Jim Crow laws, segregation, children separated at their borders, uh, police brutality, and on and on it goes. So we have these two stories of America. These two stories are being told, but they are in complete conflict. There is no common memory to our story as, as a country. So how do we get there, folks? How do we get there? This is where you come in. This is where we all come in together to kind of get to that better place. Because as I said, this is a hard conversation to have. You know, uh, the childhood I had, the childhood that indigenous people are experiencing today, right here in the state of Massachusetts, between 2014 and 2016, we had 24 deaths from either opioid overdose or suicide in the Native American community. That's two years straight, we were losing a child a month because of the devastation of all that stuff that happened in the past, because of the story that we we're told we're nothing, we don't belong. There's no curriculum that meets our needs. There's no identity, there's no self, there's no place to self-actualize outside our own community where we're already dealing with the emotional, generational and physical traumas that we've had endured. I think about my mother's generation. Um, when, she, when her time, interracial marriage was illegal. And just going back to my time in 1978, it was still illegal for me to have this and the drum and to sing. It wasn't until 1978 that Native Americans had the right to practice their culture, freedom of Native American, freedom of religion act. Can look it up. So think about the experience of the story that we've had to endure here as indigenous people. Reflect on my grandfather's time, born in 1904. He was born in Geronimo down in Florida, was still a prisoner of war. My grandfather's grandmother experienced boarding schools and land taking away by the state. And my grandfather's oldest brother was the last one to be taken. He was born in 1867 and taken at the age of 13 and didn't see his siblings until he was 18. And on the records that uh, my uh, cousin Bernie keeps, uh, has the records of when he was taken to the school and they have him listed as an inmate. So they were list listing native children and girl boys and girls as inmates when they would take them. You know, already just giving them maligning their, their identity from the start. Um, 
So again, this is this this problem that we have, this dilemma, this crisis of culture, this crisis of understanding about what America really is and what it really means to us as citizens of, of America it needs to open up and really reflect on what has really happened here. You know, I've spent, as I said, almost three decades thinking about all these different things and learning and sharing the different parts of the world. And uh, a big part of that work is uh, healing this story and sharing that story as a traditional storyteller. Whether it's the story of the three sisters, how Crow brought the corn, how uh, Bobcat lost his tail, uh, the gift of the strawberry, all our ancient stories connect us to what you're seeing back here behind me. And that's what we need, that reconnection, that remembering back to our land that was taken away from us. And we can't do that when we're, our land's being removed and we're being put on somebody else's land. We can't do that when the stories are being told, just shut up and get along and, and be like everybody else, melt into the pot. Well, what are we melting into? We don't know. Nobody really knows. We haven't figured that out yet. Um, the Native American people here in the East, we have gone up against the most powerful empire that's ever existed in human history. And we're still here. The removal couldn't take away our culture. The wars couldn't take away our culture. The disease couldn't take away our culture. The boarding schools couldn't take away our culture. We're still here. A lot less of us, yes, but we're still here. And that should tell, that should be a, an awakening to the colonized forces, to the other people of the world and think about, why are they still doing it? Why do they care so much about the land? Well, we've been trying to tell you something for a thousand years. The land, we are the land and the land is us. And this is the important fabric of what I do with my work, um, which, uh, which I'll mention um, as director of Okiteo Cultural Center. This is where all this comes into play. Uh, I'm very honored to be the director of, uh, of Okiteo along with uh, my partner in crime, Rhonda. She's uh, also the co-director. And what we do there, what we call uh, place-based uh, education, whether it's giving uh, our, our, uh, our youth a place to learn STEM from an indigenous scholar or learning how to brain tan and hide, uh, crack, uh, practice their culture, drumming, uh, dance classes, or any form of creativity exploration you can imagine, they have that opportunity to do it at Okiteo. Um, and we're really pleased to, to have Okiteo because uh, we certainly didn't have the funds to do something like this on our own within our tribal community. Um, we, were, we were supported by the Double Edge Theater, which is just across the road from Okiteo. And with generous support from the Double Edge Theater and, and the people there, they donated that space to us that we can have it now for our indigenous uh, uh, scholarship, our indigenous culture, culture explorations, and all the different things from youth to elders to have that opportunity to share in that space. So you, by listening in today, you have the opportunity to donate to that work that's going on there and the Nipmunk Preservation Trust and the other organizations that are, that are seeking that support. Um, I can't tell you how, uh, enough how, uh, how uh, happy I am to see how things are, are, are coming along. Of course, we have a lot of work to do in this world, but I'm very optimistic in terms of where I came from uh, and thinking about the different things that I had to experience uh, uh, as an indigenous person, that our voices are being heard. Um, as I said, going to uh, kindergarten and, and, and middle school and grade school, the teachers were yelling at me and, and laughing at me and mocking me for, before Native, be, for being an indigenous person. And now we're actually being listened to. And so I believe people are, are waking, waking up. People are beginning to listen. And hopefully another native person doesn't have to suffer and that we can get the services to our communities that, that are needed. And it's gonna take everybody. We're, we're, uh, we're seeking allies, we're seeking support because um, in, uh, in my different um, works and, and, and uh, uh, endeavors that I've experienced, whether it's here or traveling to Greenland or, or different parts of Europe or South America, um, just before the pandemic, I was down in Ecuador and uh, speaking at the University of Cuenca. And I got to share with some really gifted elders there uh, who actually came out of the Amazon. They knew I was coming and I was just uh, so humbled. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, Amazon elder came to hear me speak and what, a, what an honorable, honorable uh, opportunity I had to listen to his words. Uh, he came to hear me. I was just thrilled to hear him up in 8,000 feet <laughs> above sea level, which was an experience in itself. Um, and so, um, and so it's just very an honor to, uh, to, to make all these connections with our different communities and people. And everywhere I go, I've learned it's gonna take all of us as this global effort of, of coming together. Um, and so I don't know how much time I have left, but I wanna, I'm gonna get ready to close. And, but before I do that, I just wanna also um, 
share a few words about how this pandemic has been affecting all of our people. So this adds another layer of, of the crisis, right? Um, within our Nipmuc community, we've lost uh, too many people, too many people to count. Uh, and so, and I just want to send out blessings and healing to all those people who've lost somebody through this troubled time. Um, one person we lost, my, my dear cousin, uh, and traditionally we don't say that person's name, but he taught our language and um, he's deeply missed. Um, and so we have a lot of making up to do with him not being here. We have a lot of making up to do in terms of work in our communities. And I'm really honored and proud to see that the youth, the communities are coming together, the church um, acknowledging their role in the doctrine of discovery, the church acknowledging how they put forth a lot of these atrocities and really recognizing how they can turn that around and, and really help because we can all be bitter and stay angry in our own little personal corners of, of, of grief and, and bitterness, but then that doesn't solve the problem. That doesn't get us to a better place. What will get us to a better place is these open dialogues, this space where we can speak freely about my experience in, in, in Massachusetts as a native person, how it sucked. So we can get so we can get to a better place. So other students don't have to go through that. We can develop a curriculum. Okie is doing things like that. And so with that, uh, I want to thank you all for share, uh, listening to me. And um, for more on our work, uh, go to our website. Go to my website. See some of the things that we're up to. Uh, reach out to your local community wherever you are at listening to this. Uh, there's a tribe there that's probably in need of your help. So I always say go local too. So with that, I say kuta vadimish. Thank you so much, Larry, for sharing, and especially the water song. Oh my goodness, that brings back memories of the Deer Island Paddle, where we would be doing that. We would have done that last last weekend, yes. Um, yes. had had the pandemic not been here. And and again, you know, thank you. I'm so honored to be working with you um, as the co-director of Okateo. Honestly, you know this. It's been a dream of mine for many years. And, yes, <laughs> and you know, to create a better world for our children and their children's children and the next seven generations ahead. So thank you so much for sharing your powerful experiences and your truth and your word.